My next guest is a systems thinker with a hopeful view for America. Stay tuned for these extraordinary ideas. You are watching Profunda TV with host Phyllis Haynes. Hello, Steve. Hello, Phyllis. It is great to have you on the program. I've been following your posting on YouTube about Dr. Acuff for years. Thank you. Um, you're on this program because of that relationship we both have with Dr. Russell Acuff. Can you talk about him and what your relationship was with him? Sure. Uh, Russ was my friend and mentor for 10 years. We met in 1999 through our mutual friend, uh, Claire Crawford Mason. And he kind of adopted me into his systems thinking community. I was already studying it. I had studied uh, W. Edwards Deming's work starting in the early 1990s. But by 1999, Dr. Deming was gone and Russ Acuff uh, became my, my mentor in, uh, in how do you apply systems thinking to solving society's problems. Well, let's give people a little background even on Deming because Deming and Acoff knew each other. I mean, people just have forgotten what an important figure he is. So can you say? Sure, briefly, uh, Dr. Deming uh, helped develop the principles of quality improvement, which is you study mistakes and you learn from them, you don't hide them, and you view what you're doing as a system, not as a bunch of separate parts. And a brief history was he was actually sent to Japan by the U.S. government after World War II to help the Japanese rebuild their manufacturing uh, industry. Because back in those days, the U.S. wanted to help Japan after, <laughs> after we defeated them in the war. It was very interesting that Deming became uh, this, this guru of improvement for the Japanese. And Claire Crawford Mason, who I mentioned, uh, introduced me to Russ. She, working at NBC, produced a documentary on Deming's work in Japan. This is a very big deal, this 1980 documentary called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? And I invite people to go to YouTube where you can, re you can watch that documentary. It shows that an American uh, made a huge difference in Japan and what that work could mean to uh, us today and, and still can. It also made Japan a bit of a competitor with us after a while. Yes, it did. We had a, an interesting time in the late 1970s, which is why Claire went there to find out what was going on. Japanese products were very high quality now, and they were beating us in the marketplace, and a lot of people were angry at Japan, but it was only because Japan was learning from an American who was not really being listened to here at home. It was this funny quirk of history. He worked during World War II to help us build very high quality uh, uh, ships and, and airplanes. Again, it was all about learning from your mistakes. But after the war, uh, we were selling everything we could make, whether it was high quality or not. <laughs> and American industries kind of went off track. And Deming was happy to go to Japan where they wanted to learn from him. But in 1980, this documentary re, uh, re, reintroduced him to America. And I wound up learning from him again starting in the early 1990s after I stopped being a civil engineer and decided I wanted to help make society work better uh, uh, as a, uh, a quality improvement person. Which is a kind of engineer of society. That's kind yeah. of what you do. Yeah. So, so um, then you got to work with Russell Acoff. You, you studied with him after Deming died. So yeah. what's special about Dr. Acoff? Well, you know, Russ overtly talked about the whole of society almost from the first time I met him. He wrote books called Reinventing Society and Redesigning Society. Uh, Dr. Deming, his last book was called The New Economics. And if you read that book, he does talk about all of society, but he wasn't as overt. And I mention this because I believe that getting the message out that all of society can get better, not just individual companies, not just individual organizations uh, in the government. Uh, there are programs that work with government agencies, but the whole of society can improve, but it requires this unique kind of thinking 
systems thinking, some people call it design thinking, that Deming helped develop and Akoff helped develop and then he took it into this improved society realm in ways that uh, Deming did not. And I, I think one of the reasons why Akoff may have done that was he was influenced by another great friendship. He was friends with Dr. Buckminster Fuller, R. Buckminster Fuller, who uh, 50 or so years ago wrote Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Again, it's kind of like an engineer's approach to what's going on in the world. And as, as, the, as Bucky said, um, we have a chance to treat what we've got from a position of, of that everyone can win which is something that Deming said in the New Economics and was part of Russ Akoff's philosophy as well. To use our thinking to get us to see that it doesn't have to be a society, again, the design of society, does not have to be based on the principles of scarcity, zero-sum thinking, this limited pie economics. Um, uh, uh, I recently read an essay where Bill Gates said, I'm now aware that this whole notion of scarcity of supply is disappearing. You know, we, we, we spend the time to develop a piece of software and then you can distribute it basically at no cost everywhere on earth. So it's not, it's not about, you know, there's only so many cars we can build. You know, when we build software, it, it's unlimited supply. So we need to change from scarcity to abundance thinking. This is something I learned from Russ. This is something Deming talked about. This is something that Buckminster Fuller talked about. And now, now today, uh, I'm developing a plan to help get this out uh, publicly uh, because I saw that Russ thought in those terms. Buckminster Fuller thought about being public. He gave lectures to college students. And I've, I've got a unique um, approach, uh, I believe, to the whole notion of how do we go public? And okay, but I, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there because yes, yes. Um, I think people have heard the term abundance thinking. I mean, there's a lot of new age conversation about abundance thinking. I don't think that's what you guys are talking about. I think systems, we need to talk a little bit about what is systems thinking and what is it that Russell Acoff meant about systems so that we can see that he's talking about this as something which is workable. Sure, thank you for asking that. Um, what Russ wanted people to do was understand that we're not just dealing with a bunch of broken uh, parts uh, when we look at the, the challenges we face. In other words, we have a crisis in education, we have a crisis in healthcare, we have a political crisis, we have, of course, the environmental crisis. There are many things that are in crisis. But if we only seek to improve them separately, we are missing the insights that Russ offered and Deming as well. That these crises occur because the larger system that all of them are a part of has a dysfunctional design. In other words, these are not, these are not uh, uh, separately occurring events. They're, they're interrelated. It's, it's funny, we're taught in school, all these separate subjects, you know, economics, history, art. We, school wants us to think that everything is separate. It's called analytic thinking. That was one of the things that Russ uh, talked about. Analytic thinking breaks reality into separate parts. And the theory is you find the part that's broken and you fix that and you think everything will be fine. But when you, when you only address a broken part you miss the fact that it is part of this larger whole, and you miss the why question. Why does it break? Sure, you know that it's broken, but if you just fix it, it'll probably break again because it is breaking because the larger design is, defi is defective. And that's what we need to address. What is going on with the design of society? And you're not gonna get that using analytic thinking. You have to think in terms of systems. So now you've got a project I'm based on your years of study, yes. both as an engineer and as a quality person. Yes. What's your initiative? Well, I, I call it the Sustainable America Association. 
And the basic plan is to treat improving society as literally a, a professional agenda. In other words, this systems thinking approach, it's not commonly known, but it is known by the professionals in how do we make things work better. You know, engineers are a profession that, that knows when something falls down, you have to look at why it fell down. So we ask the why question all the time. I want to help people ask the why question and get to this notion of the design of society. And the best way to do this is, it's like the trade association model. People will work on this new design through a, a, a standards-based approach, through the standards of how systems thinking uh, works, you know, the principles. Uh, it's, it's a scientific method where, again, mistakes are okay. You don't look to attack people uh, on personality, which is so popular out in the larger society. You know, there's a respect component. Um, it's almost like um, good sportsmanship. You know, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. <laughs> That's what I learned when I was a kid. And in trade associations, People discuss challenges with respect because that's part of the, 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 the mission statement, literally, the values of the organization. So well, I'm, I'm, gonna throw, I'm gonna throw you a curveball because I think you're in the, you can handle a curveball. So yeah. since you bring up this issue of respect yes. without naming names, <laughs> what, what constitutes the sudden absence of respect in our public dialogue what's uh, what since you're looking looking at it systematically what's yes. causing that okay the shorter answer the short answer is people are making money from division and the kind of dysfunctional behavior patterns that that don't involve respect but involve finding something that you can accuse somebody of whether it's true or not you know it's like it's like we're, we're 12 year olds in a schoolyard now because people are making money by that kind of uh, television programming, you know, reality TV. I, I can remember the first time I turned on uh, that, that, that early reality show um, Survivor on the Island. I literally thought it was going to be about people surviving in the wilderness. And I had camped uh, in mountain climbs as a kid. And I said, this is going to be fun. Except then I saw that it was more about how the people were stabbing each other in the back. It was almost like office politics comes to mountain climbing. And I was like, what? But this was the drama that the show wanted. The show didn't just want how do people find food and water. The show wanted people to be in conflict with each other. And it was very disturbing and, and made me sad. But I understood this is the you know drama sells uh, business model. So I literally think that we have fallen out of using respect because people have figured out how to, how to monetize the opposite. And, and so respect, you know, again, uh, when I was a kid, there were shows on television that portrayed people respecting each other. Shows like Star Trek and even family dramas like Leave it to Beaver. You know, there was, there was discipline, but it was done uh, from a respectful way. And, 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 so there was money made portraying that kind of a healthier way of relating. And um, I think it, it could still be the, uh, the route to a financial gain through people knowing that not only does respect matter, but respect, respect gets us someplace. So my organization is not just going to teach that improvement is better done thinking in systems, but it's going to teach that improvement can lead us to a huge societal breakthrough. I mean, it's the stuff of dreams. You know, we're kind of living in a nightmare now. But I want people to dream just like they did when we went to the moon. We can literally fulfill the dream of world peace, getting to a world beyond war. And that's going to sound crazy, but so did going to the moon sound until President Kennedy said, you know, we're going to do it. And everybody said, well, okay, it's the president speaking, so maybe it's not so crazy. But we can do this, this transformational uh, project. All we have to do 
is understand what people have figured out that's not in the news. Again, we're, we're, we're talking about dysfunctionality. Uh, this is another piece of what my organization will deal with. What does the press cover? I, I've been a, in journalism in a, in a kind of informal way since uh, 2005. Um, I, I met Arianna Huffington at a number of conferences. She invited me to be one of her first uh, Huffington Post bloggers. And I wrote from this perspective that while we have challenges, solutions actually exist. I wanted people to, to understand that there are solutions. But you don't hear about these solutions in the news enough. You hear about the problems, um, but like there's a movement called corporate social responsibility. There are business leaders that want to change the values underlying capitalism. And a lot of people are, are upset that capitalism is all about profit. Um, uh, Peter Georgescu, a famous advertising industry uh, icon, wrote a book called Capitalists Arise. He wants us to stop thinking only of quarterly profits. And that, that's what everybody does now. They worry about quarterly profits. Even if people are getting hurt, they want to make that quarterly profit. And Peter remembers that back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, businesses thought in terms of the health of society. Uh, there's an old expression, what's good for General Motors is good for America. Right now, it's what's good for, you know, fill in the blank company is good for our, our stockholders. It's not about society, but it can be. Corporate social responsibility wants to make that change, but it's not in the news. It's, it's, it's crazy. The journalists uh, aren't covering it. Let me, stop here. Let, me, let me stop you again. You, you did a nice role there, but I got to make sure that the audience keeps up with you. I know. So I one know. of the things that Dr. Akoff, Russell Akoff said to me yes. was that is the same thing that Einstein said, essentially, that you can't solve today's problems yeah. with the same kind of thinking. It's the paraphrase. You have to, you have to solve these problems with a future kind of thinking. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, we're talking about the problem again, but that may not be the way you deal with this. So yeah. how do you plan to go about solving the problem you're presenting? The news, for example, talking only about it, quarterly. It, it, has to, it, uh, has to, it has to be a message that attracts people. Russ, mm -hmm. Russ understood that he, he wrote a book called Idealized Design. And the principles of the idealized design are, what do we want? Not what do we have, but what do we want? And if we are, are willing to dream, and, and if the what we want is hopeful, then it, it, it will A, attract uh, customers, because it's, it's what they call a, a, not customer satisfaction, giving people what they already know they want, it's customer delight, giving them something they didn't know they can have. Mm. And what, what Russ knew and what I know is we have to use idealized design to show people they can have something they don't know they can have, but that we know is scientifically possible. Again, Russ worked out the principles for transforming society into a world beyond war, um, equal distribution of resources, you know, or equitable distribution, not equal. It's not like everybody's gonna have a Rolls Royce. It's equitable. It's, it's giving people what they need so that things can work. And um, what, what my organization is going to do is it's going to rigorously explain these principles as applied to this dream. So that the dream will attract customers, again, who doesn't want an end to war? It's, it's, it's not something that we think we can have, but if we knew we could have it, who's gonna argue? Only the military industrial complex. But you know, Eisenhower told us that maybe they shouldn't have so much power. So it's gonna be a good thing to rebalance how society functions so that the military industrial complex is not as uh, a dominant um, as it is today. There's, there's been, there have been conferences called um, the uh, Peace Through Tourism, um, Peace Through Commerce, 
there literally have been people talking about this, just not in the news. So this is what my organization will help get, uh, get out to the public. Well, I'm big, on, I'm big on peace through these means that you're talking about, but I have to owe it to the listener who's saying, wait a minute now, uh, isn't deterrence important? And how we have now all of a sudden Iran doing recently uh, more in uranium enrichment and all of these problems, don't we have to have a vital and powerful military structure? Sure. Well, in the current design, where we think that there's really not enough for everyone, countries wind up having to compete over who is going to survive. I mean, this is a survival game, political survival, but also increasingly uh, human survival. And, you know, phrases like, uh, uh, we're full. And, and we can't let any more people in. That's, a, that's survival-oriented thinking. The principles of redesign can show that the root cause of this animosity, I mean animosity, which leads to death by war, are no longer, no longer true. It's, it's, you know, there was a, there was a historian, uh, he's still alive, his name is James Burke. And he, he did a 10 part series on how humanity has changed throughout the centuries when new information comes in. The, sh the series was called The Day the Universe Changed. It was broadcast in the late 1980s. And I, I, I use it in my work to show people that knowledge changes uh, historical uh, uh, pathways. And it's, it's, it's what Russ called the discontinuous change. So yes, we need a strong military right now because there is this risk built into the current design of the system. But by showing people what the new design can offer, we will show people that they can, they're still gonna have disagreements, but they won't have to kill each other over their disagreements. I'm a, I'm a fan of the Harvard Project on Negotiation. They published a book years ago called Getting to Yes. And that book, shows how two opposing sides can come up with a solution that enables them both to win. It's, it's, a th it's the third alternative thinking. And the third alternative in, in the case of war is literally to learn that war is obsolete because of scientific advancement, because of our ability to do more with less. That was one of Buckminster Fuller's favorite expressions. This is what innovation gives us. You know, my cell phone, people say the cell phone of today replaced a room full of equipment uh, from years ago. This is doing more with less on a, on a physical basis. And when you live in a doing more with less world, you see that we're gonna solve our differences, but because we're always gonna have differences, but we don't have to kill each other over them. In fact, I'll just add in, because Dr. Deming talked about uh, cooperation replacing competition. And Russ thought that there was actually a good kind of competition, and I agree. It's the kind of competition we have at the Olympics. It's competition to be your best, where you compete against the best in the world. But the idea is to use that dynamic to improve, but it's not cutthroat competition. You don't want the person who you're running a relay race against to die, you just want to be better than them. So it's, 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 it's a kind of a humane form of competition, and I, I agree with Russ's insight on that. You know, I, I'm, I love what you're saying, and my heart opens up when I hear what you're talking about and the framework from which you're operating. But having mm -hmm. been a journalist myself, yeah. I have all the other questions that come up when you talk about that. I mean, what you just described in terms of humane competition yeah. sounds great. Yeah. But let me give you a current example of a problem. Sure. I mean, I'm a big fan, for example, of artificial intelligence and the development of artificial intelligence. Oh. But now we've got a whole bunch of people, more than a billion people in China, who are committed to 
and believe that copying, and this is according to the scholars writing about AI in China, that copying is part of the process. So our property rights and our inventions over here, I mean, how can you have humane competition if you have one player that believes that your property rights are not safe or your, your creations are not your own and yeah. feel free to just take it and go? So how, big, how, do we, how do we play fair in a world like that? Well, again, short term, there's a big challenge because people are going to lose the income when their intellectual property gets borrowed or stolen uh, by uh, China, for ex to use your example. So this is not an easy solution short term. But again, I'm not a short term thinker. You know, if, if I've got a building where something has collapsed, and in this case, intellectual property rights is collapsing, I have to look at what kind of a design would enable people to make money no matter who is using their property. And there is a, a movement to guarantee people an income. And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't think of the exact phrase right now. But people have begun to wonder whether because computers can do so much, they're even going to be self-driving cars. You know, the entire truck driving industry could be changed and drivers would be out of work because trucks are going to drive themselves. When, when automation takes away jobs, it may be time to consider just giving people an income, literally. Someone once said, shareholders get money by owning stock, but they're not actually doing anything to make the company a success. They just happen to have shares in a, in a, in a company. Well, what if every American was considered a shareholder in the American enterprise and all of the money and uh, generated by American intellectual property. Now, this is, people are gonna say, oh, this is, this is crazy talk, but it's, it's design thinking. What kind of a design enables people not to worry about finances? I mean, <laughs> this is the kind of design. It's, it's a design where we acknowledge that jobs are going the way of, of they're going away because of automation. But maybe that's a good thing because if people have a guaranteed income, now they can apply themselves creatively. You know, cr creativity is how we came up with artificial intelligence. Creativity is also how we came up with the idea of, for getting to a world beyond war. This is, you know, you don't think of how we make this transition <laughs> unless you have the time and the freedom to, to think in creative thoughts. And you, you don't have that kind of time if every day you're behind the wheel of a truck or if every day you're having to, you know, work in some other uh, office job. Not to demean the work, but it just, it, it, it shortens our access to creative thinking. Buckminster Fuller once said he wanted people to go to college for free because he knew that for every 100,000 people getting a free college education, one of them would invent something and that invention would make it possible to take care of the rest of the 100,000 people, to, to give them the life they could have as a result of that invention. Buckminster Fuller believed people should basically have a guaranteed income, but I don't think it was one of his primary uh, uh, um, um, advocacy areas, but he did talk about a world beyond war, as well as a world beyond money. It's a, it's a fascinating redesign exercise. You know, where does money come from? You know, James Burke in his show, I think included an episode about the invention of money because money is, is a human invention. And, and this, is, this is part of design thinking. I don't, I don't wanna trans, uh, go on too much of a tangent, but there are some things we can't change, like we need food and water, and there are some things we can change, like things we've invented, like money. It's, it's, it's a fascinating uh, mental exercise. What do we have control over and what don't we have control over as we think to build a better world? Well, now reassure me, Steve, that, <laughs> that you aren't the only one right now talking like this, that you've got some colleagues engaged in similar 
exchanges. Yeah. You're not a lone, uh, a lone wolf in your vision. No, fortunately, I mean, Peter Georgescu, who I mentioned in Capitalists Arise, he wants us to go to long-term thinking instead of short-term thinking. That's a big leap. Uh, the people who are, tr again, tra uh, like, again, uh, Bill Gates uh, writing about this whole supply uh, demand uh, dynamic changing because shortage of supply is disappearing as a reality. Shortage being replaced by abundance. Um, so th the notion of what kind of a, of a world can we have when abundance replaces uh, scarcity is being talked about. And I, again, don't remember the phrase for the movement to guarantee people a, a, a living wage, but gosh, somebody has been experimenting. I think there's a country that's been experimenting with this. So it's not just me. If it was just me, <laughs> I'd probably be in trouble. Because <laughs> I want people, I, I want to uh, uh, partner with others and one of the things I've been reaching I've been doing uh, lately is reaching out to people um, at uh, NYU for example um, um, uh, Columbia University has a, a project um, out of their Earth Institute um, people know that this crisis demands innovative solutions and they are starting to speak of Challenging truths, again, that the military industrial complex should have less power and that we shouldn't only think in terms of solving our problems through war, that's a big deal. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop you again just to bring us back to your work. Thank you. Um, let's, you have a passion for understanding and dealing with climate change. Some of that is immediate need and some of that is long-term need. What are your views on this subject, and how, where, are, where are you in relationship to your uh, general work and climate change? Yeah, it's funny. Many years ago as a civil engineer, the uh, uh, nuclear power industry gave a talk at my college, and they said, this is the future. And I asked the guy, but your industry produces radioactive waste that remains radioactive for thousands and thousands of years. I can't support that. And he was like, well, you should because that's all that there's going to be. Well, now that's not all that there's going to be. Solar power is less expensive than ever. And so when it comes to the environment, I support uh, the Green New Deal concept where we literally see this as a society-wide uh, transformation project. I probably use that word transformation more than once, but that's, that's, that's the kind of uh, solution I advocate. It's not just improving like the, the efficiency of automobiles. It's looking at whether combustion engine automobiles are even uh, uh, necessary, and I've read Companies like Ford and uh, others are, are seeing the end of the internal combustion engine. They are beginning to realize that an all-electric car future is their future as well. Apologies to those who are fans of uh, muscle cars like the Mustang, of which I am too, but that's a kind of a legacy fandom. I, I'm also a fan of uh, electric cars. So the environment... My transformational point on this, there's a, there's a dynamic here of dominance versus partnership. The whole way that humanity has treated Mother Earth has been domination-based. We treat her like this resource that we can do with whatever we want. There are people who have studied how you treat Mother Nature like a partner. It's the term biomimicry, has been around for a number of years. Um, William McDonough has a program uh, called Cradle to Cradle Design, where you literally make all the things we need without waste. There's no pollution. It's, it's brilliant work. Um, Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute has done breakthrough 
uh, energy efficiency work. He knows that while people say the demand for energy is going to increase because population goes up and plus, you know, more people in China have a industrial lifestyle, but they don't take into account energy efficiency, radical energy efficiency. I'm going to stop you because we can't tell everybody everything. But I'm going to ask you a personal question. So I want you to think about this carefully. Um, historically, there are lots of people who had visions about the way things ought to be. Galileo, Copernicus, uh, people who saw more than the people around them. Yes. Um, clearly, you're someone and you're in the same world as a Russell Acoff existed in, where you see more than necessarily the society around you sees. Yes. How do you function day to day, psychologically, with the deterioration or challenges that you see? How do you personally uh, handle that? Well, Phyllis, thank you. Even from an early age, I was inspired by the entertainment world to think that things could happen that I, um, I didn't think could. I'm getting a little emotional because there was a time in my life when personally things were quite desperate. Uh, the story of my family, uh, even though the circumstances looked nice living in Manhattan, uh, but the dynamic within the, my family was not healthy. Uh, I had a, my father had huge problems and they uh, treated my mother very badly. So I didn't see good, but I did see good on television. And, and I was literally saved by the alternative realities, the hopeful realities I saw as a child. And today I still use that tool because this is a heroic uh, enterprise. Um, <laughs> I once talked to a professor from uh, the INSEAD Business School in Paris. Her name is Renee Malborn. She co-authored a landmark business strategy book called Blue Ocean Strategy, which is also about applied innovation. And she heard what I was up to. And she said, you're on a, um, a noble quest, Steve. And the reason I am is because I see um, um, heroism, both fictional in movies, but I do see it in these uh, scientists and other people like Russ uh, who just aren't in the news. So I'm, I'm benefiting because I'm, I'm tuned into this. And so every day when I finish being angry <laughs> at the, 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 the way that America and the world is literally on fire, I tune into the people who are, who are um, optimistic and, and are fighting using uh, the tools. Um, um, God bless uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, who's you know, 16 years old from uh, Scandinavia. She is speaking truth uh, uh, to power, uh, literally. She's spoken to the head of the UN. She, she's spoken to the heads of governments. And so I keep going because I'm, I'm tuned into other people who are also doing heroic uh, work. And again, if you watch a, um, a, a Captain America movie, you know, you, you see values that may not be so publicly on display now, but they're, they're on display in the characters. And uh, um, Iron Man, Robert Downey Jr. Here's a great fun story. Now that he's done playing that character, pretty much, he's decided he's going to um, 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 work on cleaning up the ocean. Robert Downey Jr. is meeting with people and um, um, he has been told by scientists, again, these are not people in the news, but somehow he found out about them, that we can, through technology, clean the ocean, which is a huge challenge, but he's now going to put his celebrity status behind um, that work. And well, on, that, on that note, yes. What I see that you do is that you use the world around you to support you and to keep you whole. So that's basically the answer, that you keep your eyes open for the positive 
people in your life. And you clearly are someone who is uh, positive and an inspiration. I think you and I are going to have more conversations. I have some people I want you to meet. Um, but I just thank you for your time. Thank you so very much. And I am going to uh, say goodbye to Steve Grant. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> goodbye, Phyllis. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. Thank you.